I'm Bisaluzzi, and welcome to another episode of Other Talking Points. The phrase, my body, my choice, has long been at the forefront of women's marches and protests. But despite this consistent demand, it seems that women across the globe are facing setbacks in their struggle for bodily autonomy. Recently, Polish activist Justyna Widrinska was sentenced to eight months of community service for helping another woman have an abortion, which has been banned in Poland since 2020. Though there are supposed to be exceptions in the case of rape, incest, or when the health of the mother is endangered, a Polish pregnant woman recently died because doctors refused to perform an abortion that her family states would have saved her life. The struggle for bodily autonomy has faced setbacks in the United States as well. Last year, the Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade, which ruled that women have the right to abortion. As a result, 18 states have now banned or restricted abortion, with many other states looking to follow suit. And there are cases when abortion is legal, but practically inaccessible. In Croatia, for example, abortion is expensive, and in many cases, doctors refuse to perform it. In other countries, like Kosovo and Serbia, abortion is legal and largely accessible, but there is still a deep taboo and shame about discussing the common procedure openly and without shame. It's not just abortion where women are facing setbacks. In Kosovo, a draft law on reproductive health and assisted fertility came up for a vote in the Assembly recently. During the debate on the Assembly floor, one deputy said that assisted fertility is a threat to the family as it would allow unmarried women to have children. This comment was unwelcome to Deputy Saranda Boguyevci, who declared that women must always be in control of their own choices about pregnancy, and then she faced a wave of sexist statements, both in the assembly and online. Beyond these specific cases, women's bodily integrity continues to be threatened, as shown by the prevalence of sexual harassment, rape, abuse and femicide across the world. Women are constantly judged on the basis of their looks, their sexual activity, their clothing and their choices. Women's autonomy, it seems, is still up for debate, and the ones debating it are men. To discuss all this, I'm happy to have here with me Marta Lempert, a Polish women's rights activist and founder of the Polish Women's Strike, and Szipe Jocaj, a feminist activist, gender specialist and independent journalist from Kosovo. Marta, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Shipa, great to have you here as well. It's nice to be here. Thank you. So first of all, I would like to start with a ra- rather simple question to set the discussion and to ask both of you, what does it mean for women to have full autonomy over their bodies? And Marta, maybe you can uh, kick the conversation off. Well, I think it's quite obvious. Uh, it's about making decisions to what happens to us. And I think the best uh, definition is by comparison, uh, because we can see how the decisions are made by men on their bodily autonomy, how they are man- made by the general population. So, for example, nobody is, um, can be pressured to give blood. Nobody can be pressured to give an organ. And uh, nobody can be pressured to have any um, medical intervention um, if they oppose that. And the exceptions are only made for women. And there's a general understanding um, on the patriarchy side and the writing side and the church side that, yes, these are the situations when bodily autonomy doesn't matter and people actually can be forced to undergo certain procedures or to er uh, undergo certain processes just because, yeah, the patriarchy says so. And Shiva, would you like to add uh, something to that as well? Yeah, uh, I mean, for me, having full autonomy means um, being able to make choices without patriarchal consequences like we see them every single day. Uh, But to have this um, uh, ability to make these choices, of course, you have to have services available uh, from the institutions to be able to make those choices. And that's why it's very difficult to... um, to exercise the full autonomy in countries like Kosovo and Western Balkans in general, but also 
in the world in general. So it's, I think for me, it's very broad, but basically it's just this feeling independent and able to make uh, decisions that uh, involves your body, your health, your mental health, <laughs> your sexual health, uh, being able to uh, do family planning uh, and just feeling free and not feeling fear while you do so. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Marta, I, I wanted to uh, talk a bit specifically about what's been happening in, in Poland. And I, I feel like sometimes that there's uh, this kind of understanding of democracy in a very linear way that democracy always moves towards uh, progress. So it's moving and advancing and it's going in that direction. And we think that things get better in time and especially when it comes to human rights. But what has been happening in Poland, the U.S. as well, uh, speaks to a backslide in that regard. So how did how did we reach that point? Is it does it also speak about the the importance of not taking rights for granted, but also not taking democracy for granted? So can you just talk us a bit about how that backslide took place in Poland? I think we're talking about two things here. One thing is that. No, we are actually going forward, like the like humanity is going forward with whatever is happening and with the systems and with the with human rights and democracies and so on. Um, I think our perspective is, um, is kind of mis no, maybe, no, not, maybe misled by the, by the U.S. situation uh, because we pay uh, a lot of attention, a lot more attention to, to, to the U.S. than it deserves. Um, because when I look at that, I see Latin America with countries like Argentina and so on actually legalizing abortion. I see countries like, like Poland when, of course, we have the ban, but we have the social change from 37% to 70% support in legal abortion. And we have all those countries when, when, when things actually change for good. But we see that when with the U.S. ruling is as if. Everybody now thinks that everything is going bad, everything is going backwards, just because uh, it finally got to the Americans too. I don't agree with that. Uh, and yeah, I don't want to look at, at the world just through those lenses that if sub something happens in the US, this is real. Because we're experiencing that now, like people look at Poland because something happened in the US. It's been happening in Poland for a long time, and we've been dealing this with, with this for a long time. The U.S. ruling is not something that says that that is a breakthrough thing for the world, at least not for me. And I don't want to look at this like that because this is not this is like taking out all the struggles of all women of all the countries and just focusing on one thing in, that happened in one country. It's a huge country, yes, I know, but it's just one country. So no, I don't agree with that. And the second thing is that. We have, I think we have a lot of countries like Poland where we took things for granted and we also made huge mistakes. Uh, what we did was build, after the communist time, uh, we built democracy that was based on free media, free judiciary, um, uh, free elections, but no guarantees to, uh, to any human rights, no putting human rights at the core of democracy, not treating them as something that is essential to democracy. It was just something something second thing second place and we pay for that now so because this is not only about like this basic human rights that we're talking about this is also housing this is also all kinds of social safety and poland is an example what happens if you build a country uh, it was the transformation times for only those who are rich who have their place to stay who are educated who have a lot of opportunities and you tell all the rest of the people that yeah, if they don't, you know, if they don't manage, it's their own fault because that's what happened in Poland. So it's it's no not not a surprise that the populist one, the cop, the populist government is is in power in Poland because we brought it on ourselves by leaving people behind, but saying yeah, you have to handle on your own, you have to manage. We don't care. That's what my generation did basically in Poland. We were building houses, we were building stadiums, we were being building roads and all these glass steel constructions in big cities, and we didn't care what's happening to people who are left behind. We brought it on ourselves. And that was the general agreement that human rights are not important, that this is some imaginary thing, some abstract thing. So yes, this is the danger to democracy, but this is also not backsliding. This is the hard way to learn things because we didn't have a civic society 
this huge and this 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 whole bubble of things happening and this hundreds and hundreds of cities and and people organizing and doing local initiatives before this government came we didn't have protests we didn't have this kind of civic space thing it happened with with this government it happened with these things and we didn't have support for legal abortion we didn't have support for marriage equality we didn't have support for human rights in generally in population we didn't have we still don't have the secular state we didn't have the the idea that the state should be secular that we cannot have religious laws in our law because that's what we have now we have the religious laws in in polish law in the state law so we didn't have that and that's the price it's not backsliding it's learning the hard the hard way and of course it would be better if we just did it you know normal way we were educated and we we would work before bad things happen but we didn't and i guess that's the that's the thing that's that's the way we chose that's the road we chose unfortunately the the hard one but the outcome is that 70% of people in poland want legal abortion now not and not 37 when the government came this government came 52% of people want marriage equality not 18 as this government came and so on so on and 90% of people in poland think that the catholic church is an evil entity that shouldn't have power over the state laws. This is a huge thing. Like we're we're the most we're the fastest secularizing country in the European Union, with the whole story of Polish Catholic Church being in power for so long. So this is the price that we pay. But this is not backsliding. This is backsliding on in short term. But this is the price of progress. We chose this hard way of progressing. But this is a progress still for me. Thank you. Thank you for that, Marta. I think also uh, sometimes it depends uh, like perspective from where one comes from and how you, you would see or define certain things. And I think sometimes being from Kosovo and when you see abortion being banned in an EU member state, it's for us easier to, to see of it as backsliding because we are in a potentially an aspiring country to the EU. So we get very worried when we see these trends, uh, especially within the EU, uh, with the EU happening. And there was something very important, I think that Martha also raised, Chip, and I would like to connect with you, is that in a lot of these, uh, when our older systems, political economic systems fell apart and democracy uh, came to be, in the state building processes, usually human rights get put to the side. And we saw this happening also in Kosovo, we can say at least since 2008, for sure, since the Declaration of Independence, there was always this idea that we have bigger political mm -hmm. projects to talk about and to deal with, and women's rights or uh, LGBT rights or some minority rights are secondary or in third place in terms of importance. So how have you seen this play out in Kosovo and then specifically with regard uh, to the women's struggle and to the, uh, to the women's uh, activism, because it has become also at the same time it's increased in, in vocality. If I, if I, it was always there. We've always had a very strong feminist uh, movement in Kosovo, yes. but uh, especially over the past few years, there's a lot of back and forth mm -hmm. with uh, uh, with government and uh, and with institutions. Are we seeing potentially a, a, a shift in the way human rights are talked and perceived mm -hmm. and uh, and fought for? Yeah, um, I mean, human rights are still seen as purely social issues. And they are, of course, not taken as seriously as the other, other, other issues, political, economic um, perspectives. Uh, but I, uh, I think what we have done, especially what I've seen during my activism for the, la for the last 10 years or 12 years, is that uh, we have managed to uh, come up with a vocabulary, and which was very constructive. Um, in, for example, uh, domestic violence was not a term known uh, or, or people could not advocate that it is a criminal offense until we uh, uh, the, uh, until the, the criminal code recognized it as such. And that came after many, many efforts from women activists, but also women politicians and uh, many groups of women and some men who contributed to the cause. And um, I think uh, we can uh, be proud of these types of success. Uh, when I was in high school, for example, um, I was aware of sexual harassment, but I didn't have a name for it. And uh, girls my age didn't have a name for it. And uh, we didn't know how to, uh, uh, how to fight it and how to argue against it. And uh, now when I work with young people, especially young women, I see that they have this vocabulary now. They can talk about um, 
violence against women and economic violence and sexual violence, and uh, they just know the terms. And uh, I think that this maybe can help uh, younger generations just uh, keep the fight going because it's very hard and it's very easy to go steps back. And I see that um, uh, we are going back, especially with all the disinformation happening and particularly gender di disinformation. I think that um, women in Kosovo in general, but what I've seen, what I've studied as cases here in Kosovo is that um, women who occupy public space, uh, they get backlash and they get discouraged and they are basically chased away from digital space as a public space. And I think with every kind of every dif different issues that we that we cover, uh, when a woman takes space to talk about it, she will get all of this. Um, what you've heard in the parliament when you mentioned about the MPs uh, saying uh, what they said about the, the draft law you mentioned, we hear the same uh, arguments from young men and from men in general, but also women. Uh, so I think it's a messy time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I see that uh, we, we, we have come a long way, but with uh, just um, having having this vocabulary, I, I really think it's very, very important that we have names for the problems that we advocate for. That's, uh, that's very much true, because with languages, like the entry point into also changing, be it uh, laws, institutional behavior, cultural practices, and all of that. And I'll just stay a bit more uh, with you, Shipe, since I think uh, I can connect here uh, about another case that recently happened at the parliament in, in Kosovo, where an MP, and actually a woman MP, uh, said that, and I'm quoting her, there is no femicide mm -hmm. in Kosovo. And uh, this was somehow like a statement that risks reverting many of mm -hmm. the achievements of activists and organizations when it comes to naming, problematizing femi femicide and gender-based uh, uh, violence. So f from speaking about how harmful femicide is, a, dep uh, a deputy makes a statement like that and you feel like it sets you back a bit in the, mm -hmm. in the discussion. So how do you see this affecting the discussion itself, the advocacy for policymaking and the request, request for institutional reform? Mm -hmm. uh, when I heard that, when I saw what she posted then later on, on social media, um, I stated this also in my platforms that uh, I feel gaslighted when people in power uh, deny these phenomena that we advocate against every single day, uh, you feel gaslighted, it, it affects your mental health. And it definitely uh, uh, affects also uh, the, the, the activism because people in general, even educated people, sadly, they still don't want to accept that uh, violence against women is a phenomenon. Uh, they still refuse to see our country as a country or as a country uh, that that uh, that violates women's rights, they still prefer to talk in terms of uh, exceptional cases, but they don't want to see this as a deep cultural problem. And I think what uh, uh, the MP Ganuita Muslu said, it, she does actually. This is what she does. She just um, uh, encourages these uh, conventional minds to um, to to just repeat what we've been told this whole history that we're crazy, we're making things up, this is not really happening, it's just some some exceptional cases and it's not the whole culture. So it's it's gaslighting, it definitely affects, affects our activism. Um, Marta, you started being active, if I'm not mistaken, in 2016 in protesting against the tightening of abortion laws in, in Poland and you were talking about earlier how there's also positive trends in the fact that people's opinions, citizens' opinions in Poland have changed since the ban was introduced. So now it's 70% of women that are supporting uh, mm -hmm. legal abortion, while initially it was uh, uh, it was way lower. So that's, I think, a very positive change. So how has your activism uh, changed from 2016 to, to now? And uh, what are the, the conversations happening in Poland right now to translate that 70% potentially also into a change of law itself? So um, the change was actually earlier than the ban was established because the ban was established in 2020 and the change was already, it's over, it was over 60% in 2019 uh, because we were constantly protesting because the attempts to ban abortion were all the ta on the table all the time. And we were also collecting signatures to legalize abortion. And I think like the activism changed, the activism changed in a way that it's much more dangerous. So we're past police violence and PTSD and all kinds of interventions. I'm on over 100 trials for protesting 
and yeah, it's it's basically dangerous now. That's so, so that's one thing. Uh, but of course, we have the network, we have the mental health program, we have all the security that we can have um, because it's a long run. So we cannot just do like this actions and and just hope that everything will be fine. With the with the change of this of this the pers- the social perception came the change on the political scene because these are three steps. One is the social uh, perception, then there is a change in the, the political scene, the political change, and then there is the legal change. That's that's the most you know it's in every case. So now we're in uh, in this actually we're now in this political change situation because after protests in we had one hundred days of protest when the ban was established in twenty twenty. Uh, the biggest opposition party, the conservative Christian party, declared that they changed their stand from supporting the ban to supporting legal abortion. So that's huge because they are a conservative Christian party. Uh, and it's of course, it's because their voters want legal abortion, because on the opposition side, 90% of people voting opposition uh, want legal abortion. So we had the political scene that was conservative in like 80% conservative that would always vote against legalizing abortion. It didn't matter if it was the government or the opposition. They would always vote no. They were always for the ban. And now it has changed. And this opposition party, civic platforms, the biggest opposition party is leading the opposition, basically. And they not only declared that they are, and it's a huge change because they stopped uh, the, the change from supporting the ban to supporting legal abortion means that the people who are protesting, that we are scarier than, than the church, that we are more terrifying than the bishops. Because it's not about Russia being rational or perceiving human rights. They are Christian, from the, they are Christian, they are, they are conservative, they don't care about people. But the political decision is made because they are more afraid of us than they are afraid of the church. They are more afraid of the people than they are afraid of the church. That's the huge change in Poland. When political parties less afraid of the church, and more afraid of the people. That's the, that's the thing that happened. And it, it, it's to, to all political scene. And of course, on the opposition side, there are horrible people who don't even take into account what their voters want. So we have two parties, two conservative parties. Of course, they're all conservative. So there are two conservative parties. One is Christian Fundamentalist uh, Party. Um, and the second is Agricultural Party. And their voters also want legal abortion. 84% and 78% of their voters want legal abortion. But their leaders say no. The leaders say they don't care. The leaders say it just doesn't matter what the voters want. They don't say it openly. They lie that they are for referendum. So when they are asked if they want legal abortion or, or the ban on abortion, they lie that they don't know or they are not sure that they want a referendum, which means that they want to put 200 million zlotys against our 2 million zlotys and Course, you know, and, and use the church to ban abortion in Poland for good. So these are very dangerous people. Conservatives pretending to be listening to people and 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 pushing this um, pushing this uh, this agenda about like we have to make sure we're not sure we're sure. Seventy percent of people want in Poland want legal abortion. Thirty percent of the go- government voters and fifty two percent of the neo Nazi party voters want legal abortion. So it's basically the whole society wants legal abortion. So, but this is okay. Again, this is the the fact that the leaders are afraid of the church more than they are not only about the society, but their own voters. They don't care about their own voters, and this is the pushing the political scene because the the, the um, it will be. I can I can use the U.S. example actually. The uh, electoral campaign that we will have this year will be about abortion, big time. It will be like it, like it was in the U.S. That will be the second after the economy. That will be the second element. And we will make sure that it will be the second element. And it will actually decide about the outcome of the of, of the elections. So this is our work. So on this political side, we have opposition parties that either declare that they will legalize abortion, like the civic platform, the biggest party, that they said that they will legalize abortion within six months if they come to power. And we have the Christian Democrats. No, no, they are not Democrats because they don't listen to their voters. So we have the Christian conservative parties that are not even, they are too, yeah, they are not brave enough to say we are for the ban. So they are looking for a strategy to impose the ban via the referendum with the help of the church money, of the public television and so on, so on. So this is the this is the fight. After the elections, if the opposition wins, wins, the, wins the elections, we will have those small parties trying to prevent legalization from happening. 
uh, lying that they just want to make sure they want people to think about it, blah, 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 blah. So they will be whole, doing the whole campaign. The biggest obstacle for the legal change, it's not only the, the opposition parties, some of the opposition parties who want to pretend that they are, they don't know because they're too afraid of the church and they don't care about the people, but the medical community, they are the worst. And we were so afraid when it happened in 2020. And we were calling them out already, saying that this is a test time for them. What what they will, will they do? And they did much worse. They jumped, most of them jumped on the occasion to humiliate women, to treat us horribly. The, the, what's happening in Polish hospitals, the, the situation is that if you're pregnant in Poland, you have to stay away from the national healthcare system. You cannot go to a hospital because you might die there. If you don't have a lawyer with you, if you don't have journalists that you know, you might die because they don't care. They will kill you there. And the amount of lies that the medical community is presenting that they cannot do anything, it's a lie. The law allows them to save when there's a danger to woman's life, they can do abortions when, when there's a, also this legal cause of, of rape or incest. They just don't do it. So abortion is practically unavailable in the Polish healthcare system, not because of the government. It's because of the doctors who are much worse. They were always horrible, but they are much worse than anybody could expect. And this is horrible. And they say things like, they cannot risk because they have their careers and they've studied so hard and they have mortgages and they have families. Yeah, and if we had judges, if Polish judges were like Polish doctors, I would be in jail for the last four years and all of the people I know. So when we look at the resistance of Polish judges who are being disciplined, who are being harassed, who are being... Uh, the, 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 their fight for all these years is what keeps us going because we let go if we don't do anything wrong. And we have so many brave judges. It's thousands of judges in Poland resisting every day, risking everything, and not even one doctor, not even one. It's disgusting, and it's horrible, and we have this fight ahead of us because they are already doing this campaign to go back to the ban from 1993. They will never, I don't know, maybe in the next generation, but now this generation will never openly stay stand on women's side. And it's terrifying. It's It makes me so angry. I hate them. I hate them. And this will be a huge fight because this is, they openly say they don't care. They openly say they don't care about women. They openly say that they won't ever support legal abortion. This is the, this is the obstacle. This is the political obstacle because they are a huge community. Medical community is huge in Poland and we cannot count on them. And Marta, just to ask maybe, because I'm very curious to expand a bit more on that. And you mentioned that on one side, they, there's the justification that they choose not to uh, 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 not to provide abortions because they're potentially worried about, like, quote unquote, losing their license or, or whatnot. But what more is it? Is it because of their personal beliefs as well? Is where does the medical community stand? I mean, it's a big community, of course. There's diversity within it, I assume. But is it also because of religious beliefs uh, that are more uh, emphasized within the medical community? Or is it more from that perspective of uh, safeguarding their uh, their job and not wanting to say risks, I say, uh, to take risks, I say no. in quotes? There wasn't even one doctor who was ever charged or uh, persecuted for providing legal abortion. It's a lie. Uh, I don't know why they hate women so much. I know that we had to have years ago to stop mm, women being treated like cattle in hospitals during labor, during the, you know, the most the, the, the difficult times, there was a whole social action by NGOs and the media for the doctors and the, and the nurses to stop treating women horribly in hospitals. We had to have separate social campaign on that. That's the amount of hate. That's the amount of uh, this kind of attitude that I don't know why they, like, I, you can ask me why neo-Nazis hate people, why, uh, Catholic, like, why, why Catholic Church hates people, why the medical community hates women, I don't know. And I don't care really why they are so horrible. Of course, they use the conscious objection, so the, the, this religious objection, because we have this ridiculous law that says if there is a doctor that believes that some guy walked on the water, he doesn't have to do his job, basically, because his belief in a guy that walked on the water is more important than patients' rights and the job that is paid to do. So we have this religious law in the state law, which is ridiculous, absolutely absurd. And they, yeah, they use that also, but I think I don't think it's a, 
its religious beliefs. I think that the whole thing, that the whole story, because everybody, each time somebody dies, there's the whole campaign in the media about how they are the most miserable ones because they are the part of establishment. So they go to the media and they say how it's the, the worst for them how they are in this bad situation, not the families of people who died, not people who died. They are better than us. They think they are better than us. Their lives are worth more. Their careers are worth more. They are just better than us. They look down on people. And I hate that, really. And it shows in the way they speak, in the way they react when somebody dies. They always support their friends, their colleagues. When someone dies in hospital, they never say, yeah, maybe something went wrong this time. No, they always say they couldn't do anything. It had to happen. We are at risk. They are not at risk. And Justyna Wadrzyńska is the only person who was ever um, persecuted for providing abortion in Poland. And she's an activist. She's not a doctor. And if we didn't have Justyna and the abortion dream team, we wouldn't have because we have accessible abortion on very professional level in Poland. Everything works, just not the state system. So, yeah, I don't know why they are so horrible, but they are horrible. And I don't see any change. I don't see any hope. I don't see. I just don't see it. Well, I think. With them. Yeah. Well, hopefully, with your work, I think, and of other activists, there will be change. At least, I would. I would have to say that if you have a justice system that you feel that you can rely on, I think, uh, speaking from the perspective of Kosovo, I, I think that's uh, quite a, quite a positive because Shiba, I think, in Kosovo, there's lack of trust in the judiciary and also in the mm -hmm. medical uh, institutions and medical uh, community. Yeah. <laughs> there's over the years here, I mean, there's been a lot of on and off discussion about just the lack of proper conditions and treatment of uh, uh, women in the maternity ward, for example. Mm -hmm. We know there's been a lot of cases in the past few years of, of, be, of, of, of rape, of harassment, but also femicide. And in a lot of those cases that became also very big, well-known uh, cases, the justice system was aware about the perpetrators. That, and usually mm -hmm. it was the husband or somebody in the family. And they've never taken, uh, they, they never basically delivered uh, just verdicts in those cases. And then we see women being mm -hmm. murdered, basically, because uh, they're women. And there was just recently, uh, a, a, if I can mention a positive case, of a young woman in Jilan that won the court case uh, over a former professor uh, of hers for sexual harassment. And mm -hmm. But I still think that this is an exception, uh, her winning. First of all, women, I think, across institutions are also uh, scared to report, for example, sexual harassment, but then they also don't don't trust uh, uh, the, the institutions uh, uh, in that regard. So can you maybe just talk a bit mm -hmm. about this? How do you see uh, the judiciary failing uh, mm -hmm. uh, women in, uh, in this in this regard and maybe also a bit of comparison to where the med how you see the medical community in, yeah. in, in these issues. Maybe I can start with the medical community because I've done some research uh, on reproductive rights in general and particularly on maternal deaths and that completely horrified me and discouraged me and yes I agree with Marta that I hate them after I did that research I was very discouraged and I really couldn't understand how can this happen in the institutions and people were aware of it doctors knew what it was and they simply stated it will happen again and there is nothing we can do uh, and when i was doing the research and i consulted all these uh, laws and uh, publications by world health organizations and all other relevant organizations and institutions uh, they clearly defined that m maternal health can be uh, avoided and it only happens, uh, it commonly happens in countries when there are no health, uh, qualitative health uh, care policies. And uh, it was very difficult for me to to witness this um, lack of empathy, this uh, horrible lack of empathy by uh, the medical institution who were like saying, yes, it happens and it's going to happen again and there is nothing we can do about it. And um, if we... Uh, like Marta asked, why, why, why does this happen? And we know why it happens, because it happens because misogyny is the norm. Uh, politicians, uh, judges, prosecutors, the medical community, they all think in this patriarchal, heteronormative uh, point of view. They don't see that women's rights are human rights, and they don't recognize patients' rights as, as human rights. Um, and we know that we have a, a, a legal uh, system or uh, laws that are uh, EU-based and progressive and everything. But if you just look at the, at the, at the um, um, abortion law, uh, it, it says that it uh, it's legal to have an abortion until the eighth, tenth week of the pregnancy, and so on. Uh, and 
okay, you say this is good, but in fact, when you read the law uh, from other lenses, feminist lens, you see that in at its core, it is a pro-life law. Because uh, just by the definition, this law defines abortion uh, as a, a termination of pregnancy by violence. So that's the first step to criminalizing it as an act. And when you read through it, you see that women's consent is nowhere stated as one of the priorities why a woman should be granted an abortion. And uh, you see that this, for example, just, just this concrete example shows that uh, we do have a very progressive law intact, but in practice, it is these misogynistic norms that dominate and they are reflected in the medical community and in the uh, justice system and just just everywhere. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely uh, researching and working in the in the in the health sector is very difficult because, of course, there is also a lot of corruption in Kosovo, at least. And there is still uh, not considered as one of the priority uh, um, fields to 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 really take it into consideration but also uh, uh in terms of activism and civil society women's organization feminist organizations uh we haven't worked much with uh reproductive rights of course we have stated it every once in a while but um we have not addressed them as uh, radically as we should have. And we definitely should find ways to make the medical community, to find ways to work with the medical community because they are there and uh, um, definitely they, they, they can make things, uh, they, they can change, they can help towards changing. And there are some of the professionals that I have met in different activities that uh, uh, they are pro pro-choice and they recognize women's rights and they want to work with the civil society, but they also have this uh, fear that uh, uh, they will lose their jobs, of course. And uh, so it's definitely healthcare is, is a very problematic sector to, to work with and especially being an activist. So it's one of the sectors that discourage you to, to your core, but it's one of the sectors that should be considered a priority because it's women's rights and patients' rights and bodily autonomy when we talk about reproductive rights and uh, the right to life, like when I mentioned the maternal deaths, it's just so much to work in this in this sector. And I don't know why we haven't make it a priority even within our activism so far. And what about the justice system? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think um, that's definitely, I was actually very much surprised when Martha said that at least they know that they can uh, uh, rely on a, a stronger justice system and that there's mm -hmm. also uh, judges there that uh, will not just let it let it happen. That mm -hmm. activists are, are are jailed just just like that. I mean, we don't have activists jailed in in Kosovo either. But the justice system has been failing women. It's, it Absolutely. has been failing yeah. women that are victims of domestic uh, uh, violence, and a mm -hmm. number of those end up uh, end up uh, dead by the partners that mm -hmm. they have denounced uh, to the to the police. Yes, I yeah, mean the. Have, okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Martin. Mm -hmm. No, of course we are in this dangerous situation because, uh, especially with the European Commission actually agreeing for, you know, giving a green light to Polish government to destroy the judiciary system, uh, they are actually doing that. So we have this new judges. It's called it's neo neo judges established by the non legal judiciary council that are being put on these political cases. So neo judge, for example, was this judge that served Justyna Wydrzyńska, the activist for sentence. I, I was given a neo judge in the case um, that Ordo Juris, the fundamentalist group brought against me. She, she's not even a judge, like she's not legally appointed judge and she's also, also a former ministry official that was responsible um, for, the, for the judiciary reform. So, and they don't even try to hide that, that they put the neo judges um, the, the new established, illegally established, established judges in some cases. Fortunately, they don't have enough judges to do that. But with European Commission obviously giving up on the rule of law in Poland now totally, um, it speeds up. So I, I would have one court date in two weeks. Now it's three days per week. And they are, they, they are exchanging, they're removing the judges, they are removing heads of courts, and they are establishing the new judges. So this is the, but the, but still the Polish judges have resistance and they cannot find enough judges to, they, to get to all activists. But the danger is there, of course, especially with the EU non-action on that. Do you want to connect uh, here, Shipe? Uh Yeah, um, we 
we talk about this all the time and we scream these messages when we protest that uh, the justice system is failing us and it has failed us. And we have seen this uh, with so many cases. And uh, Kate Main has this uh, notion that she calls empathy, you know, the, the empathy for the for men, uh, for the perpetrators. And I definitely see this in the in our, in our justice system. Uh, um, happening all the time we have had so many cases when uh rapists for example were um uh forgiven in one way or another and these were like official statements by judges and other professionals within the justice system saying that uh, that happened a long time ago now he's a family man and he's uh, uh engaged in community and has a job and he's a decent person and that's it uh and we never see uh we haven't we we haven't seen so far uh the the justice system being in our part and uh just protecting the victim and uh, uh so it's 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 a long it's it, it, it's i think we have a long way to go to uh to to work with uh, with 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 women I, I just i still see hope that there are women and some men but mostly women because i've interviewed them with my work uh lawyers and judges and uh the, the, there is so much potential uh between individuals that they can do they 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 can they can work with us with with the activists with the civil society to to really humanize the justice system in general but uh, still for one reason or or another they prefer not to speak publicly against the system for which they work for. So it's, yeah. Okay, maybe just uh, uh, for the end, uh, um, Marta, I wanted to talk about a bit because we, we've, we've touched upon this, like also attempts and efforts to uh, erase or block spaces where citizens, okay, if I can say, can, uh, can, let's say, can be critical, can be educated, can be, can be vocal. And there's also something I wanted to bring Hungary in a bit, just with an example of something that I think was very worrying when the uh, Prime Minister Orban signed a decree to ban gender studies in all universities in the country. And it really got me thinking how even within academia, of course, one of the first departments that will be attacked, you know, it will be the gender uh, gender studies. So these spaces, of course, risk shrinking and the presence of more conservative spaces, such as the church, for example, in, in Poland, of just like in, in increasing. And, I, and you've touched a bit about, uh, upon uh, the church in Poland. And I know uh, even uh, besides the conversation today that I know that you're a vocal advocate of secularism and I think it would be just interesting for the end to hear a bit on how you engage in that activism maybe in a society where faith is important so how do you manage to because sometimes when we speak of religion there's always like a there seems to be a thin line sometimes of mm -hmm. of y where you can go and how you can go in that conversation because people have the right to to faith but of course if religion enters into the, the the political, then it becomes a, a a problem. So, how do you engage in activism while respecting the faith of people, but also being very vocal about that when it comes to to rights? There's basically uh, there's no negotiation. So, how do you navigate those uh, those two? Mm. <laughs> well, it's, it's a hard question, actually. Mm. Let me think, think for a second, okay? Yes, of course. And it's, I mean, because yeah. this is also the, the kind of bringing the conversation to an end. And yeah. we've had similar uh, patterns, I would say, in Kosovo uh, as well. And we see, for example, religious leaders or imams or priests sometimes being invited to television. I have to just think, okay, I, I know how to say, okay, because there's a thing with that, because I had to think about it. Faith, faith is one thing, religious, in, religion is one thing, the church is the third thing. Um, both the church and the religion are taken over by evil people and we're just done with this. So we had this fear of, no, but you cannot attack people's faith, you cannot attack people's religion. Yes, we can. We can attack any religion that breaks us, that breaks our country, that interferes with the state law. So, yeah, the, the, the campaign is basically about we want secular state and putting religious laws in state law is something that shouldn't happen ever. And, and we basically see young people doing that. So we lived under this impression that the Catholic Church was important during communist times because they were helping the solidarity movement and so on and so on. But it was a long time ago. We paid that debt already and the young people just don't care. So what's brilliant, we don't have to do any campaign basically. Uh, because each time any bishop opens their mouth, they go five points down, we go five points up. They are so arrogant, they are so evil, they do so many bad things that we don't have to do much. They do it to themselves. If they were smarter, they would create some 
opposition within the church. They would create some light Catholic vision of, you know, the church that doesn't hate on everybody. But Polish Catholic Church hates everyone, everyone, women, LGBT, like everyone. They are full of hate. And each time they say something, we we just get this boost additionally. And we had to overcome this fear of saying that religions are bad. And we are open, like, like we're saying this now, I'm saying this now, all religions are bad when they interfere with the state. All religions are actually compromised because look at that. They are so consistent with their religion that they have to put it in guns and, and laws and institutions because they don't believe their religion is good enough for people to obey it without being forced to that. So what does it say about this religion? It's not convincing enough for people to obey its rules if they are not pressured to do that, if they are not forced by the state to do that, so what's the worth of the of this religion? It's worthless if they put it in the state law. And I think that especially the abortion case, but also the anti-LGBT campaign showed people that there it has to be, there has to be separation. There has to be separation. And they, they that they cannot use, even the Catholics, they cannot use the argument of but you know the church is everyone is the church we are not responsible for the what the bishops do you are responsible every catholic in poland is responsible for young lgbt persons committing suicides every religious person who says yeah but it's okay it, it has always been like that and doesn't fight actively within their church that their church would stay away from the state is, is responsible everyone's responsible and yeah that, that's basically that so we are out of we we, we don't have that fear anymore of saying that yeah, we cannot talk badly about believers. We cannot talk, talk badly about religion because actually statistics show that the real believers, the, the people who follow the religion and they go to church every week in Poland is 16%. 16%. And the church lies that they are 90%. So about the church lies all the time, I know. So this is the thing. I think that the campaign is basically just letting them speak and do whatever they are doing because they are so bad at this that they we just gain points and so we will we will cause Poland to be secular of course but they are the reason why there will be discotheques and supermarkets in the churches so they will go from just secular state that has state laws that are secular to a society that hates the church and ignores it that's their fault that's their part that's their job this is the thing that we're doing this secular state law Part. And they are doing hate on us, please, uh, thing. And I don't know why. This is maybe it's the arrogance, maybe it's the ignorance, but it works for us and it's good. They are horrible. They're horrible people. And they just speak openly about it how they hate women, they hate LGBT persons, they hate refugees, they hate everyone. So, yeah, that's, that's the thing. They do it to themselves. We don't have to do much campaign. But the connection for the people, the thing that we have to do is show the connection. We have a ban on abortion because hate, because church hates women. We have we don't have marriage equality because church hates LGBT persons. We don't have this and that because we don't have state laws that would be secular. We have religious laws. That's why it happens the way it happens. That's the connection. And we don't have human rights because human rights is something that never that any religion, no religion will ever allow to be granted. Because that, that's the thing. You can choose religion or the on human rights. You can have both. So that's the thing. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Marta. And also, Shipia, just a bit from you, maybe, how do you see this playing out in Kosovo? I know, for example, when the civil code was being discussed at the assembly, which also included the article that would open the way for same-sex unions, some deputies mentioned that maybe they said that they sh we should consult what religious uh, re leaders have to say about it, which was very problematic. And oh we see God. also, yes, and we see also <laughs> media constantly doing this, like when it's a discussion on any type mm -hmm. of human right, they they try to bring so called the so called like two sides of the uh, of the issue and to bring also re religious leaders and it's and it's of course mm -hmm. it's extremely uh, uh, problematic how do you see these dynamics here yeah i i've spoken about this many many times it bothers me so much because it doesn't make sense clearly uh, and media they don't do it just because they want to give the floor to every member of society. They do it for the views. They do it for the uh, for the show. They do it for the the freak show. <laughs> uh, it, it was just funny, sadly funny, uh, watching uh, Saranda Bogiete, uh stating uh, in the assembly, and it was being, of course, uh, 
publicly transmitted in our media that uh, she is having a baby, but it uh, she's having a child, but it's she's not married, and that's fine. And she was advocating for women to to do this and to be able to have a child without uh, without being married and without having a, a husband. And then uh, I put on TV later at night or the other night. I'm not, I, I don't remember. And uh, uh, there was this uh, prime time, of course, uh, debate with uh, mostly men in the studio, and uh, the moderator says shows the video of the of Saranda saying that which is quite radical at this point in in our in our country and uh, the the first uh, guest he introduces is an imam so yeah, he gives the floor to imam to express what does he think about women's uh, right to to have a child out of wedlock and being a single mother and so on and then he gives the floor to another imam and on, on the other side of the table you have some uh you have a journalist and people who are uh, who who have different opinions but uh, it, this is how how it goes because uh, even imams here it's it's a different uh, context uh, from poland because um even imams here are careful. Uh, not everyone says that they are against LGBT and they are against women's rights, and uh, but they do it in a more sub subtle way, and uh, they say that it's my opinion, and I'm expressing it for the people who 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 think like me, who act like me, and so on. But they get just too much space in our media, and like I said, not just because of the sake of democracy, but because the media want to have this this show and just uh, just you. Know, know encourage the audience to to react in a, in in a bad way with a with a bad intent and that's where the this uh, misinformation when this disinformation exactly uh campaigns come come after and i think saranda bogetse was a victim of one of these campaigns and i think also what they do is they um they really use this mix of also like they rely a lot on a tradition to justify mm -hmm. uh, their exclusionary uh, views because in a society that is more or less, they say, largely more conservative. Tradition sometimes works better than, well, in Kosovo at least, yeah. I feel like tradition <laughs> is more effective than religion necessarily. So they exactly. use a lot yeah. tradition to justify. Uh, uh, yeah, because their, here their even beliefs. educated women and men uh, sometimes in one way or another, they, they, they end up agreeing with a religious uh, cleric or, or, or a leader. And it's, it's very sad to see this. And you see that uh, you have only a small group of people that you can talk these issues with from a feminist perspective, from a human rights perspective. And it's very sad when I conduct trainings and workshops, even with young people, uh, maybe they have different vocabulary, but they end up believing the same things, the same conventional things the same heteronormative patriarchal point, points of view. And this debate with uh, Saranda Bogietzi and the, the, the draft law uh, that you mentioned, it, it was very uh, interesting for me to see how the the role of the father was suddenly glorified. <laughs> and we've been doing uh, campaigns and debates about the importance of a father being active in the, the, the family life and in the, the, the raising of their children, because it is uh, definitely in Kosovo, we don't have active fathers in, in this respect. Uh, and all of a sudden, we have this glorified version, an image that you cannot do this without a man, that if a woman decides to have uh, uh, d decides to get pregnant with a donor, then you are doing a huge uh, disfavor to that child because he deserves to have a real, and I'm quoting, father. You know, it was very. I mean, this society is hypocritical in in so many ways, but yeah, yeah. But I do think that just like maybe a note for for the end that I do see that there's more and more of a. Movements also learning uh, from one another. So, and I think that's why for me it was so important to have this conversation from uh, with Marta from Poland and uh, and to see what's been happening there, and then to also to talk a bit about what's been happening in Kosovo because uh, in a lot of these movements for social justice, for, for for human rights, I think a good thing that is also happening is that even if they're not working together, they are listening and watching one another. And that also sometimes gives strength when you're acting uh, locally. Marta and Shipe, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having us. Other Talking Points is a K2.0 podcast. You can listen to it regularly on our website, kosovo2.0.com, or by subscribing to Kosovo 2.0 on Spotify. Spotify.